So they were really telling that story, my story, from their point of view. So today I thought I would actually tell you the story from uh, my point of view. I was raised just north of New York City in Westchester County, New York. I was actually one of four children in the family, the so-called middle child of the four. I was educated there by the Christian Brothers of Ireland at a private Catholic school called Iona in New Rochelle, New York, where I went to school from kindergarten to high school. By the time I had reached the age of 16 in the 10th grade, my parents, after 22 years of marriage one day, decided to get a divorce. Unlike most divorces, where the children are usually the first to know, my parents were very good about keeping that a secret. I remember being in the 10th grade when the father walked in the classroom and asked a brother to excuse me from class. When I came out in the hallway, the father handed me my books and told me that one of the brothers would drive me to the county seat in White Plains, New York, where I would meet my parents and they would explain what was going on. I remember the brother dropped me at the steps of a big stone building and told me to go on up the steps and my parents would be waiting for me in the lobby. I remember climbing the steps, seeing a sign on the building that said family court, but really didn't understand what that meant. When I arrived in the lobby, my parents were not there, but I was ushered into the back of an immense courtroom where my parents were standing before the judge. I couldn't hear what my parents were saying, nor the judge's response, but eventually the judge saw me at the back of the room and motioned me to approach the bench. I walked up to stand in between my parents. I remember distinctly the judge never looked at me. He never acknowledged I was standing there. He just read from his papers and said that my parents were getting a divorce. And because I was 16 years of age, I would need to tell the court which parent I chose to live with. I started to cry, so I turned and ran out of the courtroom. The judge called for a 10 minute recess, but by the time my parents got outside, I was gone. My mother never saw me again for about seven years until I was a young adult. Contrary to the movie, my father never saw me nor ever spoke to me again. In the mid-1960s, running away was a very popular thing for young people. A lot of them got caught up in Haight-Ashbury, the hippie scene, the drug scene. Instead, I took a few belongings from my home, packed them in a bag, boarded what was then the New Haven and Hartford Railroad for the short train ride down to Grand Central Terminal in New York. My father did own a stationery store, but actually in Manhattan on the corner of 40th and Madison. Like all of us, we had to work in that store, so I made deliveries for my dad. I knew the city very well. So naturally, I started looking for the same type of work. There were a lot of signs in the windows, stock boy, delivery boy, part-time. I'd walk in and apply. So tell me, young man, how old are you? Uh, 16. How far did you go in high school? 10th grade. I'll hire you. And I went to work for a small amount of money, a few hours a day, but I soon realized I couldn't support myself on that amount of money. I also realized that as long as people believed I was 16 years old, they weren't going to pay me any more money. At 16, I was six foot tall. I've always had a little gray hair. My friends in school used to say that once a week when we dressed in a suit for mass, I looked more like a teacher than a student. So I decided to lie about my age. In New York, we had a driver's license at 16. Back then, they didn't have a photo on it, just an IBM card. So I altered one digit of my date of birth. I was actually born in April of 1948, but I dropped that four, converted it to a three and that made me 20, 10 years older, or 26 years old. I walked around and applied for the same type of work. People gave me a little more money, a few more hours, but even then it was difficult to make ends meet. One of the few things I had taken when I left home is my father had opened a checking account for me at a small community bank in Mount Vernon, New York. I had a little money in the account, so every so often I would write a check to supplement my income. $10, $20, funds were there, checks were good, but it was my friends, my peers, who would say to me, you know, you're the only guy I know walks into a bank in the middle of Manhattan. You have no account there. You don't know a soul. You walk in and talk to somebody behind a desk and they okay your check. If I walked in there, they wouldn't touch my check. You walk in, they don't bat an eye. Years later, reporters would write and speculate that that was my upbringing, mannerisms, dress, appearance, speech, whatever it was, it was very easy to do. So consequently, when the money ran out, I kept writing those checks. Of course, the checks started to bounce. Police were looking for me as a runaway. I thought maybe it was a good time to start thinking about leaving New York City. But I was quite apprehensive about going to Chicago or Miami. Wondered if they'd cash a New York check and a New York driver's license in Miami as quickly as they did in Manhattan. 
I was walking up 42nd Street one afternoon about 5 o'clock in the evening, 16 years old, pondering all of these things when I started to approach the front door of an old hotel that used to be there called the Commodore Hotel, now the Grand Hyatt. Just as I was about to get to the front door of the hotel, out stepped an Eastern Airline flight crew onto the sidewalk. Couldn't help but notice the captain, co-pilot, flight engineer, about three or four flight attendants dragging their bags to the curb to load them on a van to take them to the airport. As they loaded the van, I thought to myself, that's it. I could pose as a pilot. I could travel over the world for free. I probably could get just about anybody, anywhere to cash a check for me. So I walked up the street a little further to 42nd and Park. I went to cross over. I heard a huge helicopter. I looked up and there was New York Airways landing on the roof of the Pan Am building. Pan Am, the nation's flag carrier, the airline that flew around the world. I thought, what a perfect airline to use. So the next day, I placed a phone call to the executive corporate offices of Pan Am. When the switchboard was ringing, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to say. When they answered, Pan American Airlines, good morning, can I help you? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'd like to speak to somebody in the, um, somebody in the purchasing department. Purchasing? One moment. The clerk came on and said, yes, sir, maybe you can help me. My name is uh, John Black. I'm a co-pilot with the company based out of San Francisco. Been with the company about seven years. Never had anything like this come up before. Uh, what's the problem? Well, we flew a trip in here yesterday. We're going out today. Yesterday, I sent my uniform out through the hotel to have a dry clean. Now the hotel and the cleaner say they can't find it. Here I am with the flight in about four hours. No uniform. Don't you have a spare uniform? Certainly, back home in San Francisco, but I never get it here in time for my flight. Uh, do you understand that this will cost you the price of a uniform, not the company? I understand. Hold on, I'll be right back. He came back and said, my supervisor says you need to go down to the well-built uniform company on Fifth Avenue. They're our supplier. I'll call them and let them know you're on the way. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to know. So I went down to the well-built uniform company Little fellow, Mr. Rosen, fitted me out in uniform. Back then there were black Aberdeen, the three gold stripes on the arm, the gray hair. I certainly looked old enough to be the pilot. When he was all done, I said, how much do I owe you? Well, the uniform's $286. I said, no problem, I'll write you a check. <laughs> no, um, we can't take any checks. Oh, well then I'll, um, I'll just pay you cash. Oh no, we can't accept cash. You need to fill out this computer card. Then in these boxes, put your employee number. Then we build this back into uniform allowance. Comes out of your next Pan Am paycheck. Well, that's even better. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> New York had two airports, LaGuardia and Kennedy. LaGuardia was 20 minutes from downtown. Kennedy was about 50 minutes away. LaGuardia being the closer of the two, that's where I went. I spent most of the morning walking around LaGuardia in the uniform, trying to figure out now that I had the uniform, how the hell to get on these planes. Well, I got a little hungry about lunchtime, so I walked in the luncheonette, sat down at the counter on the stool, and ordered a sandwich. Moments later, a TWA crew walked in. Flight attendant sat in the booth, pilot sat at the counter on either side of me, captain right next to me. Now, back before deregulation of the airlines, airline people thought of themselves as just one big family. So they didn't hesitate a moment to talk to each other, and the captain kind of leaned over. Hey, young man, how's Pan Am doing? Doing just fine, Captain. Tell me, what's Pan Am doing out here at LaGuardia? Pan Am doesn't fly into LaGuardia, they only fly into Kennedy. Well, I picked up on that right away. Yeah, we came into Kennedy, had a short layover, came over to visit some friends of mine. Matter of fact, I'm on my way back to Kennedy now. So tell me, young man, um, what type of equipment are you on? Now, airline people have a lot of jargon for things, and one of them is they never call a plane a plane or an aircraft, they call it equipment what type of equipment you're on and what type of plane you fly back then at DCA to 707. Of course, I didn't know that. I thought, what type of equipment am I on? The only equipment I'm on is a stool. <laughs> they must mean what type of equipment is on the planes I fly. So I thought, well, they've got the wings and they've got the engine. They always had a sticker on the engine, who manufactured the engine. So I said, yes, General Electric. All three pilots kind of just stopped eating and Captain leaned over and said, Oh, really? What do you fly? Washing machines? I know I said the wrong thing out the door. Only. 
Everybody had an airline ID card, plastic laminated card, much like a driver's license today, yet without the ID card, the uniform was worthless. Went back to Manhattan pretty discouraged, thinking, where would I come up with a Pan American Airline corporate ID? I was sitting in the hotel room, I noticed a big thick Manhattan yellow pages sitting on the dresser. So I pulled the phone book down on the bed, flipped it open, and looked under the word identification. There were three or four pages of companies who made convention badges, metal badges, plastic badges, police badges, fire badges, started to call around, and finally one company said, listen, most of those airline IDs manufactured by Polaroid, 3M company, need to call one of them. Finally got the 3M company on the phone in Manhattan. Yeah, we manufacture Pan Am's identification system along with a number of other carriers. How come? So I tell you, I'm a purchasing officer for a major U.S. carrier. I'm in New York just for the day. We're getting ready to expand our routes, hire a lot of new employees, go to a formal ID. We're very impressed with the Pan Am format. Wondered if I came by your office this afternoon briefly, we could discuss quantity and price. By all means, come on by. So I went by dressed in the suit, the sales rep opened the book. Yeah, we do United, Delta, Eastern, Pan Am, Pan Am. We like this Pan Am format. Wonder if you might have a sample I could bring back. Sure, I'll be right back. And he brought me back a five by seven glossy piece of paper with a picture of an ID card blown up in the middle of it. Someone else's picture in the picture. John Doe for a name. And in bold reading across the front, this is a sample only. I said, no, I'm afraid this won't do. You know, I need to bring back an actual physical card. And by the way, what is all this equipment on the floor? Oh, no, we don't just sell this card. We sell the system, camera, laminator. I see we have to buy all this. Absolutely. Straight how it works and use me. Fine, I will see you right here. Took my picture, made it the car. I was going down the elevator studying the card. It had a blue border across the top, about a quarter of an inch in Pan Am's color blue, but not a single thing on the card said Pan Am. No logo, no insignia, no company name. This was a plastic card, like a credit card. You couldn't type on it, couldn't write on it, couldn't print on it. Discouraged, I put it in my pocket, headed back to the hotel. As I was walking back, I noticed I had passed a hobby shop, so I turned around and walked back. Excuse me, sir, I see you sell a lot of models here. You sell models of commercial jetliners? Sure, over there. I bought a model of a Pan Am 707 cargo jet for about $2.40, took it back to my room, opened the box, threw all the parts out, but there at the bottom of the box was a sheet of decals that went on the model, and when soaked in a glass of water, the little Pan Am logo, the blue glow that would have went on the tail of the plastic plane went perfect up at the top of the plastic card, and the word Pan Am and the special styling and graphics that would have went on the fuselage went perfect across the top of the card, and the clear decal on the laminated plastic made a beautiful identification card. Pan Am says they estimate that between the ages of 16 and 18 years old, I flew more than a million miles for free, boarded more than 260 commercial aircraft in more than 26 countries around the world. Pan Am says keep in mind that though Frank Abagnale did in fact pose as one of our pilots, he never once stepped on board one of our aircraft. That's true. I never flew on Pan Am because I was afraid someone might say to me, you know, I'm based in San Francisco, been out there 20 years. I don't recall ever meeting you before. Or someone might say, you know, your ID card is not exactly like my ID card. So instead, I flew on everyone else. If I wanted to go somewhere, I literally just walked out to the airport and looked on the board, United Flight 800 to Chicago. Then I went downstairs to the door marked United Operations and walked in. The operations clerk, hey, Pan Am, what can we do for you? I was wondering if the jump seats open on 800 need to get in Chicago. Jump seat, it's open this evening, I'd like to get a pink slip pass. I'd give my ID, write me out a pass, I'd walk out, hand it to the flight attendant, she'd open the door to the cockpit, and I'd step in. They had a captain, a co pilot, a flight engineer, and a seat behind the captain called the jump seat, where the pilots did hit on company time. Now, because pilots love to talk shop, once you picked up that jargon, it was the same conversation over and over and over. <laughs> so I just step on board, even General Bob Davis, you're right in Chicago. On the taxi app, always the same question. So Bob, how long have you been with Pan Am? Been flying about seven years. What position do you fly? A right seat, which is airline terminology for a co-pilot. What type of equipment are you on? Had that one down. Perfect. <laughs> Matter of fact, whatever they flew, I didn't fly. So I had no problem with that. 
I would arrive in Chicago, I'd go by the Pan Am ticket counter, but just enough to get the attention of the passenger service rep. Yes, I could help you? Excuse me, where do we lay over here? And they did it a trip where somebody got ill, never laid over in Chicago. And so we use the Parma House Hilton downtown. Got your crew bus law level door three out. I go down to Parma House Hilton, walk in, and on the corner of the registration desk was a little sign that said airline cruise. That was a three ring binder. You signed in, referenced your flight number, showed your ID. I'd stay two or three days in Pan Am would be direct billed for my room and my meals. I also could cash a personal check at the front desk up to $100 because I was an employee of the airline. The airline had a contract with the hotel, and they'd cash your check. But then I found out that every airline honors every other airline employee's personal check, a reciprocal agreement still practiced today in 2013. So a Delta flight attendant can walk up to an American airline ticket counter, show her Delta ID, and cash a personal check up to $100 and vice versa. Of course, when I found that out, I'd go out to JFK or LAX, only I'd go to everybody, Northeast, National, KLM, Air France. It would take me a good eight hours, stopping at every counter and every building. By the time I got all the way around the other end of the airport, at least eight hours had gone by. And what do you have in eight hours? Shift change, new people. So I'd go all the way back. <laughs> I made a great deal of money. The only reason I quit at 18 is the FBI issued a John Doe warrant for interstate transportation of fraudulent checks or federal offense. The John Doe warrant meant the FBI didn't know my identity. In the warrant, the FBI said based on interviews with people I had contact with, I was approximately 30 years old. I was 18, had a great deal of money. So I hung the uniform up and moved to Atlanta, Georgia. In Atlanta, I moved into a very swank singles complex that had just been built there called the Riverbend Apartments. On the application for the lease, there were a lot of questions for a teenage boy. One of them was occupation. I began to write down airline pilot, but the next question said employed by, supervisor's name, telephone contact. I thought to myself, I'll need to come up with something that would be impossible to check out. Yet something that would justify why I drive an expensive car, wear expensive clothes, don't work much. So I wrote down the word doctor. First thing came to my mind, nothing else, but I had a very inquisitive apartment manager. Oh, I see here you're a doctor. Uh, yes, ma'am. What type of doctor are you? Well, I'm a, um, I'm a medical doctor. <laughs> However, I'm uh, not practicing medicine right now. I left my practice out in Los Angeles to come to Atlanta to invest in some real estate I have. So I won't be practicing for a while. How interesting. Well, tell me, what type of medical doctor are you? And I figured being a singles complex, pediatrician would be pretty safe. So I moved in, Dr. Frank Williams, pediatrician. Everybody called me doc, always the typical questions at the pool. So doc, where'd you go to medical school? Uh, Columbia University in New York. Where'd you serve your internship? Uh, Harvard Children's Hospital out in LA. Once in a while, one of the guys would come by and walk up, hi doc, Look at my leg. I don't know what I did to it. Look at this. Uh, Robert, I can't look at your leg. You need to go to your own doctor and have him examine that. When the girls came by, I was gave them a thorough examination. And them, <laughs> I was young, but not stupid. <laughs> I was living there. One after, everything was going great. One afternoon, there was a knock on the door. A very distinguished gentleman, mid-50s, standing there. Yes, sir, I could help you. You were Dr. Williams? Yes. My name's Gordon. Just moved in the apartment below. Wanted to come up and introduce myself. A uh, new neighbor, come on in. Well, I'm not only a new neighbor, I understand that you're a pediatrician. That's correct. Uh, I'm the chief resident pediatrician of the hospital up the street. Dr. Gordon was going through a divorce, just separated from his wife. He was very upset, very lonely. Every day on the way to the car, out to the pool, he'd stop me. And after a minute or two about the weather, he'd start speaking medical terminology. Not being able to converse with him, I in turn would cut him short. But I knew eventually he'd get suspicious. Determined not to move, every day I went to Emory University's medical library. Every day I read the daily journals from Johns Hopkins, from the Mayo Clinic. Every day I took a certain part of the journal, memorized it in detail. And every night when Dr. Gordon pulled in his parking slot, and I do this without exaggeration, every night I was sitting on his doorstep. Hey, Doc, hear about this new theory they're using up the mail? Uh, what is it tonight? And I'd follow him into his apartment. Aggravated, he'd go in his bedroom to get undressed. I'd go in his bedroom, sit on the edge of the bed. Be in the kitchen, I'd go back and forth. Be in the bathroom, I'd talk through the door. Pretty soon he'd come home, hey doc, I don't have time to talk to you right now, I gotta go. Guys start to avoid me, which is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> One afternoon I received a phone call from the hospital administrator, who is not a physician, but the administrator of the hospital. 
Dr. Gordon suggested I give you a call. I said that you would be more than happy to help us out. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, on the midnight day shift, I have a doctor supervising a number of interns, nurses on a shift, just been notified of a death in his family. He's returning to the West Coast tomorrow for about two weeks. A Georgia law requires the house doctor on duty be a full practitioner or a specialist. Dr. Gordon suggested you had a great deal of free time. You'd be more than happy to cover the shift in an administrative capacity. Uh, there's no way I could do that. Why not? Uh, I'm not licensed to practice medicine in the state of Georgia, just the state of California, where I hold my residency all the red tape for two weeks. I uh, know red tape, we bring it before the medical review board tomorrow morning. They issue a temporary certificate. You can start tomorrow night. Now being one who hates to pass up a challenge, I couldn't help but give it a shot, so I went up to the hospital. During my entire stay there, no one ever doubted for a second that I was not a doctor. When the doctor returned, I left the hospital. I did pass the bar in the state of Louisiana, not in two weeks as the movie implies, but in two months by taking the two-month prep course any law student would take before taking a state bar examination. The state of Louisiana at the time did not require a law degree to take the bar. I passed the bar in the state of Louisiana. I went to work for then Attorney General P.F. Brimion in the civil division of his state court, where I spent about a year, no one the wiser, on my own, I resigned and left. A lot of people say, you know, it's not so much the people you impersonated as a teenage boy, as it is the crimes you perpetrated as a teenage boy. Well, I did a lot of things that had just never been done before, so they got a lot of attention. I was walking down a Chicago street one day counting five $20 bills in my pocket. As I was counting them, I noticed I had passed the front door of a bank. There was a sign on the window that said, open a checking account. So I thought to myself, I'll go in this bank, open a checking account with this $100. I'll give them this phony Pan Am ID for identification. In two weeks, this bank will mail me 200 printed checks in a box with this name. And with this ID, I'll cash them anywhere. So I walked in and opened the account. The new accounts person came back. So here's a receipt for your $100. These are temporary checks. We'll be mailing you your printed checks in about 10 days. Now being young, I was always inquisitive. So um, I noticed you didn't give me any deposit slips. No, sir, they come from the check printer. Be in the back of the checkbook, put in your name, your address, your account number, get them in about 10 days. I see. I was just curious if I wished to make a deposit, say tomorrow, next week. Uh, not a problem. You see the table in the lobby? Has all those forms on it? Just go help yourself to a blank deposit slip. Then in this box, just write in your account number I just gave you. Use those till you get your printed ones. So I walked over and took a big stack of them off the shelf, went back to my hotel, couldn't sleep. I kept staring at them on the dresser. But when the morning came, I went out and bought what was called the Burroughs 1000 magnetic encoder. Looked like a big green calculating machine. And I magnetically encoded my account under the bank it assigned to me the day before on the bottom of every one of these blanks. I then went back to the bank, put them on the shelf in the lobby, and everyone who came in put their money directly into my account. <laughs> I was at the Logan Airport in Boston. I was trying to catch a flight. It was about a quarter to 12 at night. I ran out to the airport. The whole airport was closing down. Rented cars, gift shops, ticket counters. I walked up to the ticket counter. Uh, excuse me, you're uh, closing the airport? Uh, actually, the airport lies in the heart of the city. It comes under the noise abatement control program. We have no jet operations after midnight. Next flight out is at 6.30 in the morning. I sat down wondering what to do. I noticed they were sticking all their cash and receipts in these big bank bags. Then they zipped them closed and locked them, put them under their arm to the bank that was in the terminal. They'd stick their key in the night box, open it, drop the bag down the chute, make sure it went all the way down, closed it, locked it, one right after the other, Hertz, Avis, Delta, Eastern, Dobbs House, dropping the bag. I didn't give this a lot of thought, but I came back to the airport the next night, about a quarter to 12. I rented a bank guard uniform from a costume store in Boston, hung a beautiful sign over the night box, said, night box out of order, please leave all deposits with guard on duty. Everyone did. I was a nervous one sitting there going, I'm gonna box me out of order. I mean, that's like a mailbox without an order sign. Of course, like any criminal, sooner or later you get caught, and I was no exception to that rule. I was actually arrested just once in my life, at the age of 21, by the French police in a small town in southern France called Montpellier. The 
The French police were arresting me actually on an Interpol warrant from the Swedish police who were looking for me for forgery in Sweden and believed that I was living in France. When arrested by the French authorities on the Swedish warrant, the French authorities realized I had forged checks all over France, so they refused to honor the warrant and the request for my extradition. They later convicted me of forgery and sent me to French prison. I served my time in a place called the Maison d'Iré, the House of Arrest, in a small town in southern France called Pepignan. Steven Spielberg told Barbara Walters, it was extremely important to me to go back to that prison, to the exact cell Frank was in. And according to the log books, that was a blanket on the floor, a hole in the floor to go to the bathroom, no plumbing, no electricity. He said the log book showed I entered the prison at 198 pounds left the prison at 109 pounds. When my sentence was over, I was extradited to Sweden, where I was later convicted of forgery in a Swedish court of law and sent to a Swedish penitentiary in Malmö, Sweden. When my prison term was up in Sweden, US federal authorities took custody of me and returned me to the United States. Eventually, a United States federal judge sentenced me to 12 years in federal prison. I served four of those 12 years at a federal prison in Petersburg, Virginia. When I was 26 years old, the government offered to take me out of prison on the condition I go to work for an agency of the federal government for the remainder of my sentence or until my parole had been satisfactorily completed. I agreed and was released. This February of this year, I'm celebrating 37 years with the FBI. I work in Washington, D.C. I make my home in Charleston, South Carolina, where I live with my wife of 36 years and my three sons. My youngest boy is 28 years old, graduated from the University of Beijing in China, went on to get his master's degree at the University of Beijing. He reads, writes, and speaks Chinese fluently. He works for an American company in Beijing. My middle son graduated from the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, went on to get his master's. He's in business. My wife owns a business in South Carolina. He manages that business for her. And my oldest son graduated from the University of Kansas. He went on to Loyola School of Law in Chicago, got his law degree, passed the bar in Illinois, went on to make his dad very, very proud. He's an FBI agent in our counterintelligence unit in Baltimore, Maryland. As many of you know, I had very little to do with the movie because I work for the government. I'm not allowed to receive money or funds from books, television shows, Broadway musicals, or motion pictures, and had very little to do with the making of any of those uh, stories that brought to film or, or stage. I am very blessed that it was Steven Spielberg who decided to bring my story to the screen. I felt that he went out of his way not to glorify the things I did, but to simply tell the story about what I did. In an interview with Barbara Walters, he said, and I quote, I did not immortalize Frank Abagnale on film because of what he did 40 years ago as a teenage boy. I actually chose to immortalize him on film because of what he's done for his country for more than 30 years, unquote. In the end, my family and I are very pleased with the result of the film. Now, needless to say, as you know, the film became a musical on Broadway. It's on tour in the United States. It was in Korea. Uh, it's obviously won to Tony on Broadway. Uh, it's gotten a lot of attention, so consequently I get hundreds of emails back in Washington, D.C. What has always been interesting to me, the emails never stop over the last 10 years because they constantly play the movie over and over on American television. And for that reason, I get emails from people as young as 8 years old to people as old as 80 years old, somewhere from around the world, who are seeing the movie probably for the first time and feel that they need to write me, and not expecting an answer, but want to make a statement. Some write and say, you were brilliant. You were an absolute genius. I was neither. I was just a child. Had it been brilliant, had it been a genius, I don't know that I would have found it necessary to break the law in order to just simply survive. And while I know that there are people fascinated by what I did almost 50 years ago as a teenage boy, I've always looked upon what I did as something that was immoral, illegal, unethical, and a burden I live with every single day of my life and will until my death. There are many who write and say, well, you know, you were certainly gifted that I was. I was one of those few children who got to grow up in the world with a daddy. And the world is 
full of fathers. But there are very few men worthy of being called daddy by their child. I had a daddy who loved his children more than he loved life itself. Steven Spielberg would later write that the more I researched Frank's shoes without the use of Frank, I couldn't help but put his father in the film through the likes of Christopher Walken. My father was a man who had four children, three boys and a daughter. Every night at bedtime, he'd walk into your room. He was 6'3". He would drop down on one knee, kiss you on the cheek, pull the cover up, and he'd put his lip up on your earlobe and he'd whisper into your ear, I love you. I love you very much. He never missed a night. As I grew older, I sometimes fell asleep before he got home. But I always woke up the next morning, knew he had been by my bedside. Years later, my older brother joined me in my room. He was 6'4", in the Marine Corps, but my father would walk around to his bed, hug him, kiss him, whisper in his ear, he loved him. When I was 16 years old, I was just a child. All 16-year-olds are just children. As much as we like them to be adults, they're just children. And like all children, they need their mother and they need their father. All children need their mother and their father. All children are entitled to their mother and their father. And though it is not popular to say so, divorce is a very devastating thing for a child to deal with and then have to deal with the rest of their natural life. For me, a complete stranger said I had to choose one parent over the other. There was no choice, so I ran. How can I tell you my life was glamorous? I cried myself to sleep till I was 19 years old. I spent every birthday, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day in a hotel room somewhere in the world by myself. When I was sick, I took care of myself. The only people that associated with me were people who believed me to be their peer, 10 years older than I actually was. I never got to go to a senior prom high school football game, or even share a relationship with someone my own age. I always knew I'd get caught. Only a fool would think otherwise. The law sometimes sleeps. The law never dies. It was just a matter of time. I was caught. I went to some very bad places. My boys have grown up asking their mother, why is it that dad gets up in the middle of the night, goes down the TV room, and doesn't turn the TV on? He just sits there all night because there are things you can't forget, things you're not meant to forget. While I was sitting in that pitch black cell in France, my father, 57, was climbing the subway stairs as he did every morning. He was in great physical shape. He just happened to trip. He reached his arm out to break his fall. He slipped. He hit his head on the railing. He landed at the bottom of the step. He was dead. I didn't know he was dead. I was sitting in that cell. I was thinking about him, how much I couldn't wait to see him, hold him, hug him, kiss him, tell him how sorry I was. But I never got the opportunity to do that. I was very fortunate because I was brought up in a great country where everyone gets a second chance. I owe my country. 800 times more than I could ever possibly repay it for the opportunities it's given me these past 37 years. That is why I'm at the FBI today, 26 years beyond my legal obligation to do so. I have turned down three pardons from three sitting presidents of the United States because I do not believe, nor will I ever believe, that a piece of paper will excuse my actions, that only in the end, my actions will. 36 years ago, on an undercover assignment in Houston, Texas, I met my wife. When the assignment was over, I broke protocol to tell her who I really was. Didn't have a dime to my name. I eventually asked her to marry me against the wishes of her parents. She did. Now I could stand here and tell you that I saw the light and was born again. I could tell you that prison rehabilitated me, but it didn't. Or I could take a cheap shot 
and just say I was a kid who made some mistakes and grew up. But the truth is, God gave me a wife. She gave me three beautiful children. She gave me a family. And she changed my life. She and she alone. Everything I have, everything I've achieved, who I am today, is because of love of a woman and the respect three boys have for their father. If we're lucky, many of us grow up and we have children. And as every parent in this room knows, whether your child is 33 years old or three months old, when you lay your head on a pillow at night, no matter where that pillow is, and you're just about to close your eyes, the last thing you think about, the last thing you worry about, are your children. So if you still have your mother, you still have your father, you give him a hug, you give him a kiss, you can. And to those men in the audience, both young and old, I would remind you what it truly is to actually be a man. It has nothing to do with money, achievements, skills, accomplishments, degrees, positions, professions. A real man loves his wife. A real man is faithful to his wife. And a real man next to God and his country put his children and his family as the most important thing in his life. Steven Spielberg made a wonderful film, but I've done nothing greater, nothing more rewarding, nothing more worthwhile, nothing that's brought me more peace, more joy, more happiness, or content in my life than simply being a good husband, a good father, and what I strive to be every day in my life, a great daddy. It's been a pleasure being with you. God bless you, and thanks for having me.